Okay, so if you could start by just telling us your name and school and what you teach. I am Kelly Fisher. I am a kindergarten teacher at Las Brisas Elementary School. Great, and are you a member of a teacher's union? I am. I'm a member of the Arizona Education Association and the Deer Valley Educa Education Association is my local union. Awesome. I'm president. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> and before we, we get into talking about how COVID-19 has impacted your teaching and classroom, if you could just maybe tell us a little bit about your school community. Absolutely. I uh, work in a school where I've been there for 14 years and it's a very tight knit community. It's um, a, a school that was built with the neighborhood planned around it. So um, it's been a neighborhood school for 25 years and um, we now have the, the, the kids who went there now have their children going there. So it's a very tight knit, um, long history uh, school. And we are probably middle to high socioeconomic, a lot of uh, second language students and um, a lot of very supportive families in our school. Awesome, thank you. And so, I'm just going to jump into the questions now. And my first one is, when did it hit you that COVID-19 was really going to impact your school and um, your school district as a whole? It doesn't even need to be like a, a date or something, but if you could just tell us, talk to us about kind of what was going on, what you remember about that, that whole time. Well, um, March 13th was our last day of school before spring break. And that was sort of when we were hearing about how bad things were in Italy and how bad things were starting to get in New York. And um, we, we had no idea that we would not come back, but something told me to tell my kids goodbye. And I stood at the door that day and I thought, I don't care if I'm late for duty, I'm going to tell every single one of them goodbye and hug them and tell them that I love them. And I did that. And they probably thought, what is this late? What is wrong with this? <laughs> you know, let me get on to my spring break. I've been get, you know, working hard to get here. And I, I think it really hit me when I was sitting in my um, staff meeting, we had an emergency staff meeting during the following week. And my principal said, we're having an extra week of spring break. And I knew then we weren't going back. And I think the hardest thing, that one of the hardest things that I have ever had to do was to go back into my classroom and pack up all their things the following week and know that it was gonna get thrown in a garbage bag for the kids to come and get with a piece of paper taped on the front. And that broke my heart. So I think that's when it really hit me that this was gonna be something completely different. Wow, that's, yeah, that's such a, what a kind of vivid uh, memory and especially having such like little ones that like, like you do yeah. that I can't, yeah, that, whew, that's, that, would, that would have been really heavy. Um, it, it was really hard. I, I will tell you that I made a couple of attempts um, to see them. I drove to their house twice. And once it was, I had a little, just a little bag of goodies that just to help them occupy their time, knowing that online learning wasn't going to take their whole days. I gave them a little journal and just some fun little goodies. Um, and I did sort of a ring the doorbell and run. And I just stayed at the car and waved at all of them. And, um, and then, and that was really hard because a lot of the kids came running out the door and I hadn't made it to my car in time and they wanted to hug me and I had to say, no, we can't hug right now, it's not safe. And you know, to tell a five-year-old, no, you can't hug me was heartbreaking. And so at the end of the year, I went around and I had called all the parents and said, I have been in the house, I have not left. I have picked my groceries up from the grocery store where they put them in my trunk and I drive away. Um, I'm going to come and bring their end of the year gift. And I had actually, brought home all of their special projects. We make a memory bag at the end of the year in my class and we put in something we've made that's special to us from every month of the school year. 
and then they write about it and take it home as a gift to their parents. So I made what I made it for them. I brought everything home and my husband and I put up the bags in my hallway and we passed out all the papers and I took that and an end of the year gift to all of them. And I told the parents, you know, I said, I will knock on the door. And if you want to send your child to the door to see me, great. And if they, if not, I totally understand. And so I did get to see a few of them and have a little bit of closure, but it, I, I will tell you that the first day of school was really hard knowing that another teacher had my kids and I never got to close the year out with them. It was, it was really hard. Yeah, no. And, um, I, it's amazing what you were still able to, to pull off at, at the end there and bringing all those, those projects. How, how else did you kind of navigate that new, kind of brave new world of virtual learning and stuff with your kindergartners? I'm really curious as, as to how well, that, that went for you. <laughs> I tried, I, I really kept the conversations fun and funny and light. And, and the, the benefit of last year as compared to this year is that I already had a relationship with all of them. You know, I had been with all of them for three quarters of the school year. I knew where they were academically. I knew their personalities. Um, so I did a lot of fun and games. Even, even when I was expecting them to do learning, I turned it into something fun for them. And I I made it something that I knew that they had enjoyed in class. And I did a lot of um, individual parents would text me. I gave them all my cell phone number, knowing that this was just an unprecedented time. And granted, you don't normally hand your cell phone number out to every parent, but this was different. So um, I gave my cell phone number out and I did a lot of FaceTime phone calls with the kids one-on-one. -on -one. Um, let them, you know, let them tell me how much they missed me and I told them how much I missed them and let them, you know, share with me how sad they were. I, I tried to keep that separate from what we did in the classroom. I tried to keep the classroom going as a cohesive unit as we were all there for each other. And if someone was sad or having a bad day, we all were there to pick them up. And if they needed that time to cry to me or needed some extra support or care from me, I tried to do it separately, whether it was a one-on-one -on -one Zoom or a FaceTime on the phone, whatever it was that worked so that it was, you know, not brought into the classroom. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and you're, you're kind of, you're, the, this one question I have, I, I feel like you've already mentioned a bunch of kind of memorable moments. One of my questions I've been asking folks is, you know, is there a particularly kind of memorable moment you had your last few months of the school year with you know, a, a particular student or parent or, or in your classroom as a whole. Um, but like I said, you kind of offered quite a few. I mean, is there something that really stuck out to you? Um, maybe a, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not even gonna um, offer ideas, but I'm just curious if there's anything in particular that really sticks out to you. Yeah, there, there is. Um, my husband, went, my, my husband uh, drives for FedEx. So he's been working this whole time. And he was always the one that would just bring the mail in. I virtually hardly ever left the house in the spring. And he brought the mail in one day and he said, you got this envelope. And he goes, I can barely read it. It was, you know, kid writing. And he said, I don't know how it made it to our house, but I, it had no return address, so I had no idea. But I opened it and it was just a piece of simple notebook paper that they had torn out of a binder or something. So the holes were ripped on the side. And it was a little picture of me and one of my students. And it said, I love you, Mrs. Fisher. And I still have it hanging on my refrigerator because you know, it's gotten splashed, it's gotten knocked on the floor and stepped on, but it's, it's still on the refrigerator because that, to know that, that they still felt the same way about me even through the computer was really special. That's beautiful. And what a testament to the, the relationship you built with your students that, yeah. that they would send you that. That's incredible. Um, wow. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Absolutely. And before I get into my, my last uh, couple questions, I was hoping that actually you could just tell us a little bit about your, your classroom setup behind you. Um, oh, absolutely. Just, yeah. So if you could just, I, I think it's just so, so great. I, I would like to know a little more about it. Well, we um, were allowed one day 
to go in. We had a two hour time slot that was assigned to us to go into school and grab anything you could possibly think of that you might need. So I did, but I didn't think about like, what am I gonna put it all in? So when I came home, I decided that this room, because it was my craft room and sort of my little space would be the perfect spot because I, what I did with it was my own choosing. So all the baskets you can see behind me, I emptied out all my craft supplies and I put in all of my ABC letters, my magnet boards, everything, my dice for math games, all of the things that I use in the classroom normally because I thought I'm gonna keep this as normal as possible and I'm going to find a way to make it work. So I even, um, you know, in kindergarten, one of the big things is the calendar. So I don't know if you can see right there, that's that my messy table from, I've been assessing kids all week, but that poster board is my school, my classroom calendar. So we do the calendar every day. We, we talk about what the weather is like, what season it is. We talk about the day of the week. We talk about how many days we've been in school. And I, you know, my friend was Amazon. So I ordered it and I laminated it myself and I put it all together with Velcro so that we could still keep our routine as, as normal as possible. And if you walked into my classroom, my classroom is, is bright pink and black. The whole, all the walls, the cubbies, everything in the room is pink and black because we are the flamingos, Mrs. Fisher's flamingo flock. So I grabbed a bunch of my flamingos and uh, had a friend cut out from her little craft cutter, the flamingo banner and you know, just tried to make it look as much like our classroom so the kids felt like it was still us. It was just us. So, and we are still going to do the same things and we're still going to have the same fun. And, you know, we even managed to find a way to do an end of the year party. I held a talent show on Facebook and the kids all got a chance to do their little talents. And, you know, so I just feel like making this feel still like part of our world was really important. Wonderful. Yeah, it looks so uh, <laughs> vibrant. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, my, you my need last... Your sunglasses for my classroom, though, because <laughs> literally the bulletin board paper is hot pink. Everything's pink. There's flamingos everywhere. Besides one shelf of every bobblehead that the Diamondbacks, the Arizona Diamondbacks, have ever put out, I do have that because I love baseball, too. But besides that, the whole rest of the room is flamingos everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> That's, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So, yeah, my, my last big question is, is kind of a big and sprawling one, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts on school reopening. I know you all reopened virtually this week. So yes. just, just curious about like, what are your thoughts about everything going on with, with schools reopening? What, if you were in charge of schools, what would you have, have said about this school year? And, uh, and maybe it's kind of folded into this. You mentioned earlier this week about a, a, the motor march that happened this, this week. And if you yes. could just talk maybe a little bit about that in conjunction with this too, I, that would be great. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> first of all, if I were in charge, I would, not, I would not pick some arbitrary date as to when we're going back. I would make statewide scientific data-based guidelines that every school was expected to follow. And that's when we go back. It's not some random date I chose off the calendar. It would be science-based and it would be based on the data from our state and every school district in the state would follow it. And I feel like um, that's where our downfall is and that's where the motor marches came from. Um, we held, the Arizona Educators United group held a, um, a town hall just for people, like an open forum town hall to discuss uh, going back to school safely and what we as teachers wanted it to look like. And out of that, uh, one of my colleagues spoke up and said, this is not okay and we have got to do something about it. And she's never been a leader per se of teachers. So she thought, oh no, what did I just do? And she called me and said, I need your help. So I stepped into this group and we, for the last four weeks have held motor marches across the state because we knew that was a safe way to engage people. And we painted our windows with messages about what we wanted to open our schools safely. We want guidelines, we want uh, funding for 
PPE and plexiglass wherever they feel they need to put it and all of those things that doesn't put another financial burden on our school districts. And we drove around uh, and we would just make sure we were in very populated areas and go past, you know, accidentally go past district offices and things like that. And um, they just grew and grew and people, the more, the more we did them, the more engagement we had. So last, this past Monday, we took our motor march to the governor's office and we started at a park that was about two hours away or two miles away. And we drove about a hundred, there were over a hundred cars. We drove down to the governor's office. We drove around honking our horns and we stopped and we delivered a pile of letters that people had written. We, uh, my friend and I delivered them to the governor. And um, some of them were written as obituaries, as teachers writing their own obituaries. Some were written as a heartfelt letter. That's what mine was, more of, you know, don't put this burden of having to deal with the death of a student or having a student have to deal with the death of their teacher. Don't put that burden on us. You have the right, you have the power to fix this. And some people wrote it as the, from the aspect of it being their last lecture they ever, that they ever gave their students. Um, and from, from then, you know, we, we haven't decided what our next move is yet, but I really feel like as I talk with my colleagues, we, we have way more questions than we do answers. And we have far more concerns than we do solutions. Um, you know, we're, we're told they have to wash their hands frequently. Okay, well, if I, if I have, and Arizona has one of, if not the highest class size average in the nation. And for example, in my school district, we can have 29 kindergartners in a class before we would get a new teacher. So to, to imagine 29 five-year-olds and trying to manage that and keep their hands to themselves, keep them in a seat, keep their masks on, keep them you know, safe while they're at recess, have them wash their hands frequently. How does that all work in a classroom? And how do we space them apart far enough that they could potentially have a mask break in class where they could take their mask off? Because right now we put six kids at a table and you couldn't, they're not six feet apart. And you know, that's a huge concern to us. So, we keep asking all of these questions and we haven't gotten a lot of the answers yet from our state leadership. So we're just gonna keep asking them because I firmly believe that, that, there, that, that even though there are teachers that think it's safe to go back now, the majority stand, stand in solidarity with us that it is not safe for us or our students or much less the communities our schools are in for us to send our kids back to school. You know, there's such a huge ripple effect of what that would look like from the kids to their parents, you know, the colleagues, their families, and, and the communities that they live in, because we don't all live in the community we teach in. So it's just a lot to think about even imagining going back at this point. I mean, right now, I think in Arizona, we have a 16% positivity rate, but there's a lag so we don't even know what it looks like now, you know, in current week time. So how do we measure that that would even be remotely safe to send our kids back to school? So. Yeah, thank you so much. That's, yeah, that you, you hit on, on so many interesting things in that response. Yes. One quick follow-up I, I actually have is this Arizona Educators United group. Is that like a, a formal group? Is it like a, a Facebook group? I'm just curious uh, about it, that. It is the group that forms, we're a grassroots group. Many of us are union members, but not everyone. Um, we are the group that formed uh, the Red for Ed movement out of Arizona two years ago. Uh, and I was, I am in leadership in that group and we are the ones who worked with the Arizona Education Association to plan the strike. Um, so, it's, it's, uh, we're still going because we know we have a lot of work to do and, and we, um, you know, have found ways to find other leaders like, like the people who started the motor marches, you know, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a, 
It's a great group. It's an interesting group. We always tell people we work inside the union, outside the union, and alongside the union. That's how we work. So, yeah. That's a great, yeah, that's a great, like, crystallization of, of yeah. your strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that pretty much brings us to the end. The last thing I always ask folks, though, is if there was anything that you left unsaid or any last thoughts you want to share um, before I, I cut off the recording part, I just kind of open floor for anything else yeah. you want to share? I, I, would, I would love to. I would love to talk about, um, there are a lot of groups in Arizona um, who stemmed out of the Red for Ed movement who, are, who call themselves Purple for Parents. And now they are the green group and they are the open schools now group. And they put us in a class with the grocery store workers and um, people like that and, and the frontline workers technically. And we are not those people. That, that is not what we signed on for. What we signed on for was to educate the future of our country. And while I have no problem putting myself in harm's way, you know, to protect my students, none of us signed up to attend the funeral of a student. And none of us signed up to attend a colleague's funeral. And none of us signed up to ask our students to attend our funeral. And it's quite a different situation when we put ourselves in harm's way if there's an active shooter on campus. That's something that's out of our control, that's out of our legislators control that's out of our governor's control. But when there's a when there's a pandemic and there are decisions that could be made by our state leaders and they're not made, that is a completely different situation. And I will continue to fight along with my colleagues to make sure that when we go back to school, it is under the safest possibilities that we can that we can manage. And it isn't that we don't want to do our jobs. I am working probably more now than I worked when I was in the classroom because when I was in the classroom teaching in a brick and mortar building, I could lock the door and get in my car and drive home and leave stuff on my desk to do later. Right now, I get up and walk from this room to the other room knowing that everything is still sitting in here waiting. So when I'm done with dinner, what's the first thing I do? I come back and work on schoolwork. When I wake up in the morning, instead of sitting down and watching the morning news, what's the first thing I do? I bring my coffee cup that's still sitting here and I come back in here and start working for the day. And I've literally, it's 626 and I've been in front of my computer since about 630 this morning. So a 12 hour day and I still have things to do before I go to bed tonight. I have to do my newsletter. I have to finish looking at my assessments so I can start my small group instruction on Monday. So I really feel like I would beg of the people who don't understand where we're coming from to stop and think about the situation they're asking us to put ourselves and our students and our communities in. Because it's much different than standing in front of a grocery store cashier for two minutes while you pay your groceries, pay for your groceries. Thank you so much. Yeah, so Absolutely. I'm gonna pause the recording portion.